This is Story Beat with Steve Cuden, a podcast for the creative mind. Story Beat explores how masters of creativity develop and produce brilliant works that people everywhere love and admire. So join us as we discover how talented creators find success in the worlds of imagination and entertainment. Here now is your host, Steve Cuden. Thanks for joining us on Story Beat. We're coming to you from the Steel City, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Well, my guest today, the extraordinary Diane Deleen, is a violinist, composer, recording artist, and educator. Her jazz work has earned her the Downbeat Magazine Critics Poll Rising Star category four times. Jazz Times Magazine said that, quote, her elegance and expertise are always obvious, close quote. Diane's performances have included playing at Ireland's Cork Jazz Festival, Sunset Sunside in Paris, Jazz Ahead in Bremen, Germany, New Orleans Snug Harbor, Chicago's Jazz Showcase, and the Chicago Jazz Festival, among many others. All of Diane's five albums on the Blue Jazz label have received international airplay and reached the jazz charts here in the United States. Diane has toured with her own groups and has also been a section player for a wide variety of artists, including the Manhattan Transfer, Ray Charles, Brian Wilson, Garth Brooks, Smokey Robinson, Gladys Knight, and many others. She's also been an adjunct professor at Columbia College since 2004, where she has taught jazz, classical, folk, and pop strings, as well as string improvisation, jazz combo, and chamber music. Please be sure to stick around at the end of the show for a special treat. We'll have a chance to hear Diane's composition, Winter Horizon, from her CD, Origins. For all of those reasons and many more, I'm delighted to welcome one of the very best jazz violinists of our day, Diane Deline, to Story Beat. Diane, welcome to the show. Thank you, Steve. It's nice. a great pleasure to have you here. So tell us a bit about your history. Let's go back in time. Where did your love of music begin? Was it when you were a little girl? Yeah, I, I think it was always around us. I came from a very creative family and they encouraged us to be creative as opposed to watch TV. And mm -hmm. the, um, so my mother's statement was always, are you being constructive or creative? <laughs> what are you doing are you being constructive or creative and those two things were you know the, the was was <laughs> was the notion of play involved in that constructive and creative thing oh absolutely yeah so playing so was a big part of it i i think that's a huge part of what kids need is, is some kind of play to let the outlet for creativity happen absolutely it's self-exploration it's self-actualization you um kids start knowing who they are at that point. Mm -hmm. And and when did you think to yourself, mm, I really like that that stringed thing over there called a violin? When did that happen? Well, that was actually kind of imposed on me, honestly. <laughs> but um, I had a wonderful grandmother who I was so close to who loved violin. And um, she wasn't able to play to take lessons because they were poor. She had to go to work when she was 14. Mm -hmm. I think she took one year of lessons. And um, then and my parents, we had a, a musical family and my parents, I remember them sitting me down one day and saying, you know, there's more room in an orchestra for violins than there are for other instruments. So right. Violin. I'm thinking, okay, this is already being chiseled at. I wanted to play flute so I could walk around in the park and play, you know, for the seventies, <laughs> what can I say? <laughs> but the, um, so my, and my grandmother really wanted me to play. So the influence on both sides was decided for me and it actually worked out fine because I found that I did have resonance with it. <laughs> so so you, you wound up being a violinist because there was more space in an orchestra. <laughs> right, which I, you know, I do, occasionally but i'm not an orchestra band player so there's mm -hmm. yeah. so so who were your earliest influences then with the with your instrument with the violin um in my genre or in general oh both let's hear what your major influences are um i don't think i listened to a lot of music unless i was studying like um violin players unless i was studying the piece so I go back to the days of David Oistrakh and Itzhak Perlman and, you know, the 
um, some of those greats back when I was studying. And then um, with jazz, actually, the thing that turned me on to jazz was, you know, Bill Evans and the cool period of Miles Davis. And, um, but mostly it was something about Bill Evans. And I don't know if you're familiar with jazz, but there were these recordings oh, from the Vanguard. Sure, sure. That I just listened to over and over again, the interplay and the underplay of notes. I did not, I don't resonate well with people who play for the sake of throwing a lot of notes in there. I believe that every note has a purpose. Okay. And that, you know, it's it's a placement of color and rhythm that that gives you have to play the spaces as well as everything. So so for the listeners who may not understand, what does under the underplay of the notes exactly mean? Um, what I mean is that a lot of people um, look at jazz as a workout you know the battle of the bands i don't know if you've ever heard that i have but, <laughs> but you know people are like okay how how heavy how much you know pounding can i do on this and get all this stuff out and all this high energy stuff and there's a place for that there definitely is sure and i did go through that period to compete when i was younger but it was never my resonance point um to show off technique and to show off um sort of a, a mounting tension my i mean there is tension but i think it's built through subtlety and that contrast and so i've always felt that nuance goes a lot for, farther in reaching somebody than just having something f flat out right in front of them um almost like technology now you know if, if you have a video mm -hmm. and it defines the music for you. You lose the nuance of reaching in and discovering what that music is really saying to you. Sure. Okay. So, so you got that from listening early on to Bill Evans, or was were there people along the way who increased that that feeling for you? I think I chose to listen to people who did that, but I also listened to acoustic music, um, acoustic folk it didn't matter to me the genre as long as the musicality was there in a way that i could resonate with you were also listening to classical at the same time i assume classical yes and i was playing classical i played classical i was uh, i graduated from northwestern with a you know a performance classical performance major. so that so that's where your is that where your major training came from or did you have a lot of training prior to northwestern well, I started playing violin when I was nine. So I had training all the way along. And yes, I was always, um, by the time I was in high school, I was taking two lessons a week with my oh, teacher. Wow. And I was, yeah, there was a lot of, because it actually came easily for me. And so I think he said, you know, let's see what we can do with this. The problem was that I had, um, I have a capacity to memorize things very easily. Right. It's not a problem, but. My, my regular memory is not good, but my musical memory is a different part of the brain, and that works great. Great. And so by the time I was, you know, ready to graduate college, I thought, well, I've played all this music. Hmm. And am I going to just have to keep playing this music over and over and over again? Were you, were you bored by it? I was, I think I was reaching for something new. I wasn't mm -hmm. bored. It was, it was nice. Um, it was stimulating to play in big groups. It was wonderful, but I was reaching for something new. Did it, when you were, when you started playing at nine and all the way through your training, including Northwestern, did you always feel like you were in love with playing or were there ever times where you had to struggle to get past? I don't know if I want to do this again, because I know a lot of young people struggle with that. They don't know whether they want to do this for the rest of their life. Well, that's another. Yes, absolutely. It's um, it is hard. And if you, I mean, it, again, for me, my parents said, you're so good at violin, you need to go to a conservatory. I thought maybe I wanted to be a writer. But uh, a writer, I, a writer of prose and fiction and that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. And because I um, had so much invested in the violin, they said, give this a shot, you know, and because I was, I was quite advanced for my age. Um, so they really thought that I should follow through. 
Um, I don't know because I never made the choice myself, you know? Well, and, and ultimately you did become a writer, but you were a writer of music, not of that's words. That's right, yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, that, that somewhere in you, you knew you wanted to create, not just interpret. Right. I think the whole thing is about that. Yeah, the process of self-expression. And it, did you feel early on that it was a calling for you to play that violin or was it that it just kept being imposed upon you by people around you? I had satisfaction in that I did well with it. And you and you enjoyed playing, though there were times where I'm sure, I mean, it sounds like there were times where you were questioning this, that and the other thing. And it wasn't a sure thing for you when you were, say, 12 or 13. Oh, no, it was. I mean, when you're 12 it's okay because it's another thing that you do that's, mm -hmm. you know, although I was made fun of in the school I went to for carrying an instrument. That what, was back. Yeah. Why were they, why were they making fun of you? Because you were, was it too nerdy or something? I think so. I think so. It, it, in the junior high level where I was, um, it was considered nerdy to play instruments, but um, I think that that was okay because I got enough reinforcement from the lessons and for my success at home doing it that I, I didn't mind it. But I, I think that um, to go back to your question about, you know, it's hard for people, it was hard. It's hard for kids to not um, want to do other things when something um, requires consistent daily attention. Well, this is one of the hardest things for any artist to go through, and that is this thing called discipline. You, right. you, you have to just do the work because it, it, it can't be given to you no matter what your natural gifts are. The professional part of it requires discipline and practice and so on. We're going to talk more about practice here shortly. Um, I, I'm, I'm curious, at what point did you know early on that you were really good? Even I know people were telling you this, but did you know it? When did you know you were really good at it? That's a question of self-esteem, actually. Well, sure it is. Yeah, so um, did I, I could see that things came easily for me. Did I think I was really good at it? Not until I became an adult and I, li I mean, classically, when I became an adult and I listened back to my senior si recitals and that sort of stuff, I was like, wow, you know. Then you knew. Then I knew, but I don't, and after I had, um, it's, it's kind of interesting. I think that perspective is a is a great gift giver because yeah. while you're in it you're always one of the issues about being an artist is you're always or at least a musician is you're critiquing and you're um always is this right is this good is this what i want is this and all that questioning sometimes can get in the way of actually just letting go and playing you 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 work at it and work at it and work at it and then you just let it fly that yeah that's the idea it's a left brain right brain partnership and it's a certain point you have to let go of of well you know. when you're when you're first developing your craft your art yeah. um it's very easy if you have the talents early on the bit maybe not the total package yet but you're you have the talents for it it's pretty easy as a young person to dismiss those talents and think eh, it's nothing i just do this and then so it makes it even harder you really have to dig down deep and be disciplined about it Yes, I, I, that that's a huge thing in my thinking because I've been teaching screenwriting for ten years, and it's about discipline. It's about doing the work. It is about it. Yeah, and if it comes easy, you don't need that discipline younger. So yeah. okay, today you've been at it for a while now. Um, aside from performing and teaching and so on, is there anything that you do every day or many days a week to to further your your abilities? What do you do? How do you work it? Um. I have to reach back before time of COVID because life has <laughs> well, that's for sure. shifted for all of us here. Um, and I should say for the listeners, we are having this chat in, uh, it, the show will be released a little later, but uh, we're having this chat in January of 2021 and we're still in the middle of COVID, so. Yeah, yeah, so it's been, a, um, well, I have, um, we have homeschooling, you know, remote learning going on at home and stuff like that. So it's my time is a little different, but um, I think that on a daily basis for me, the things that help are just to have fun with the instrument. And, um, and what does that mean? How do you have fun with the instrument? What do you do? I, 
whatever mood I'm in. Sometimes it'll mean um, just sitting down with a, um, in any genre. No, well, actually not rock and roll for me personally, but, <laughs> you know, although I've done that, but, but lately it's more, um, you know, it can be acoustic based music, um, folk derived or singer songwriter derived and just playing on my instrument and exploring my instrument in different ways with voice leading and that sort of thing. Or it can mean sitting down and playing Bach, the original improviser. Or it can mean um, working through, um, well, often I sit at the piano and that's where I compose. So that to me- Well, that's interesting. You compose at the piano, not on the violin. Yes. And, and why is that? Why do you do that? Because the piano has more of the full orchestra in it? Correct, yeah. So, so I can have all the harmonic choices and then I can distill um, what I want from that, yeah. All right, so I, you know, I've listened to a whole bunch of your work at this point, and when I listen to it, I, I can tell that you really actually love what you're doing. It's not just a job to you, it's, you, it's a passion. And, and so how much does passion function in what it is you do? Is that a, is it a, an absolute necessity for an artist to have passion for the work? I think absolutely. I think that um, on two levels. One is if you don't have it, you're not going to survive because the arts in our country are not supported and you have to have that to push through. Mm -hmm. um, on another level, um, you have to be authentic and that is, that's passion. That's your, you have to take your spirit, if you will, and, and express that through your work because you have an individual voice. Every one of us, you know, we all have different fingerprints. It's really hard to believe that there could be all these people all over the planet with different fingerprints, but we have that much difference in our beings in our way to express ourselves. Well, one of the things that I think is the hallmark of what I, when I listen to your work, obviously, if I'm listening to a recording and not looking at you play, um, all I'm able to, to uh, take in is the sound itself. And what I hear is I can hear your voice in your playing. Well, I, can, Thank you. I can hear your expression in the playing. Was, did you have that early on or did it take a while for your voice to emerge? Um, I think if... I think I was always connected to expressing um, who I am through my music, whatever. Your play. your your playing sounds like you're speaking. That's I, nice. That's lovely. I, I, I can hear it. You can hear it when you're playing. You have a distinct uh, playing sound. It's it's not. It doesn't just sound like anybody. It sounds like you. Thanks. That's that's lovely. So, <laughs> so I, I want to talk about um, the creation of music. All right. So. When you are developing a new song, which you now I now learn that you do at the piano, not on the violin, which I find lovely. And I've had any number of composers on the show, and they all compose on the piano as well. And that's why it's it's actually not surprising, but yet it was surprising. I was expecting you to tell me you compose on the violin. Um, when you're writing or arranging, do you have a place that you like to start? Is it, or does it always start differently when you're coming up with something new? It depends what I'm writing or arranging. So if, um, if it's the, like one of my CDs was a commission and um, I had to, it was actually a commission of non-season, it was non-denominational seasonal music, which, and we had two weeks to pull it off. Okay. So, and, and so, you know, researching international music and what can we do that's traditional and all that stuff. Um, but one of the things that they required, and this isn't a ranging thing, this isn't a composition thing, but they required um, one Rodgers and Hammerstein song. So at that point, I was like, okay, what should I do? What should I do? And one night I'm about falling asleep and this whole arrangement popped into my head of my favorite thing. So I just went, got up, wrote it down and boom, there it was. Um, so that's that's for that kind of a thing, it can come that way. Other times for themes, things that are um, like origins, you mentioned that CD, and this is gonna sound strange, probably. That one was written one winter, 
I don't know, in, in maybe a month or two, I can't remember, but I just sat down at the piano and I listened. What do you mean? What do you mean you listen? You listen to you play it? No, I just sat there and I listened. I just, it was almost like I meditated. I just stopped and I listened for something to come in. You were listening for the universe to give you something. Yes. Got it. And, and it just, what did it just suddenly come to you? Did, did you, yeah, did it just happen? Things, things started flowing through. I've had an enormous number of creative people tell me that, that, um, that creativity flows through them. They don't create anything. It comes through them. That's absolutely, I think that's correct. I think that if you put your ego in there, you lose a lot. Mm -hmm. It's it's, um, because your ego is going to be, it's going to filter with, oh, is is somebody going to like this? Is this a pro, you know, all that stuff. You know, process, you you talk about, I love that your show is about process. Well, thank you. (laughs) We lose lose so much of that right now. And as, as you know, process in life is like two steps forward, one step back, right? Sure. Sometimes it's sometimes it's two steps forward and six steps back. Exactly. <laughs> um, but so what it is for me, that process is in composition is you open up, you receive, and then you take the one step back and you tweak it with whatever you know. And then mm-hmm. you open up again and you receive and then you tweak. And um, so it's a it's a partnership. <laughs> between your intellect and your instinct or, you know, um, or whatever you want to say. Uh, you're, some people used to call it the muse. Some people say it's channeling. Some people, you know. Indeed. And, and, and so it's, it's many things. Yeah. Cre- creative people, scientists, inventors, um, artists, and so on will say it came like a bolt out of the blue. It just, there it was, and it came fully formed. You'll hear, you'll hear composers say that the, the, the writing of the piece took minutes because it was right there. Right. That has happened on some pieces. Oh, for you, that's happened. Yeah. And, and is it astonishing when that happens for you? I'm like, oh, okay, this is here. And then, wait, now, did I just, did I steal this from somebody? <laughs> yeah, why is it here so fast? So then I have to go back through. Because that is one of the things that would, when you have a good um, musical memory, is that you can you can inadvertently. Well, you, yeah. you you know not to be cliche about it, but the old saw is that that you're standing on the shoulders of those who've come before you. So that those influences are always going to be there. Yeah, as long as you don't do a direct rip off, you're fine. <laughs> well, but what you're talking about, going back to what you're talking about, which is that it came fully formed in such a way that you thought that maybe you'd heard it before. Yeah, I was like, well, I, I think of one song in particular where it came that way. And I was like, okay, is this, you know, where did this come from? Because the progression was a little bit, well, not without getting too technical, it had elements that are standard to every progression. Um, and um, it had... I was just thinking that perhaps I had heard it before, and then I went through, and I, I hadn't, you know, I didn't recognize it. You know, it took me a while. To... It, it, it was original to you, is what you're saying. Yeah, it was very. I verified it. I think. So when when you're uh, either arranging or creating something new, um, mm-hmm. do you consider the audience? Are you thinking about the audience at all when you're creating it? Never. Never. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> no, never. It's not about that, and. Um, not to say that the audience isn't a huge part of that live performance thing. That becomes a different issue. But the no, this is just simply about asking for the creative process to give me what it needs to give me, mm-hmm. create, and taking it from there. Yeah. Well, you're, you, in other words, you're writing it so that it satisfies you. Well, sure. And, and you're not in the consideration of whether some group of people, random strangers, out in the theater somewhere are going to like it or not is not part of that equation. No, it's not commercial. The, there, there are times when you write commercially. I mean, I've, I've been asked to write string arrangements for pop, say a pop singer or something. Then you have to go to the style the pop singers sing in and the kinds of um, things that are used in that pop genre because it's simpl- it's very simplified compared to what I write and you know <laughs> that kind of thing, and so um, yeah, then you then you it's all technical, it's all. 
So when you get an assignment like that, do you start to listen to lots of music that's in that pocket? If um, it's been a while since I've done that, but I think that I was have been up on it enough through I teach at Columbia College, which is a urban music school. Right. Um, and it's um, so so what the things that we teach there are definitely pop is a huge component of that. So I think that I've had to remain up on that that genre. So by virtue of teaching, you've had to stay current on that kind of music. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, that, that, that makes sense. I'm going to ask you a question. I ask lots of people, lots of guests, mm -hmm. and it's always interesting to, for me to hear what the answer is. What for you makes a good piece of music good? If I can connect with it. Okay, and, and what does that mean? When, just that so you can feel it? Is it a feeling? Um, oh, sure. It's a, it's a, it goes to your heart. And so, um, at least for me, um, and when I, and if I can be expressive with it, I mean, some things are a good piece of music can be, um, quirky. It can be even a little dark in places, mm -hmm. but if it expresses a range of emotion that makes it good to me. Well, I think you've just hit on the key, which I think is, is everything is that music more than pretty much any other art form. Although I suppose you could go to some of some of the visual arts. Music is emotional, mainly. It's not really academic or intellectual. At some point, somebody has to think about it academically or intellectually, but the creation of it, the playing of it, the acceptance of it by an audience is an emotional experience. That's right. Yeah, and, and you want to have, I mean, that's what makes an audience want to be there, is that they're participating some way, and so you have to reach them and so where are you going to reach them is it just something flat or are you going to interact emotionally yeah all right so so <clears throat> when you're teaching young folks because you've been doing that for a while too um what would you say are the most common mistakes that you bump up against in terms of up and coming students common mistakes the things that that people might think to themselves i'm doing it the right way but it's just it's not the way to do it I think the mistakes are as varied as the as the people are, as the students are. Well, that's a great answer. Um, because they're trying to, I think maybe if I look at the biggest one, is they're trying to emulate so much that they don't realize that their voice is as important as anything else that they hear. And so they, while they have to learn the craft of analysis and, and harmony and all these things that they're going to apply to what they do, they need to express it the way they express it, not by emulating or copying somebody else. I have a, what I see a lot with the violin community is that people want to sound like other violinists that came before, Stefan Grappelli or Ponty in the 60s, mm -hmm. who sounded like like um, Coltrane, you know, or, you know, they, they have somebody they identify with and and they, um, I think that they, I really would encourage, and I do this with my students, that they everybody's got a new voice. They've got, you know, like, again, like I said, everybody's so very different. They have something else to offer and we restrict ourselves by not trusting that inner voice. You still have to be educated about how you write a piece of music so that it makes sense harmonically, so that, you know, it doesn't like, it's not disjointed or whatever, to, so that you can then apply those techniques um, to reaching people in a place that people can resonate with. Would you say that, that sometimes you run into students who just are all they're concerned about are technical proficiency, but not the expansion of themselves into the playing. Correct. Yeah, absolutely. Because they're still, I mean, the, I love working with college students because their, um, their evolution, you see so much in four years. It's just amazing. You know, oh. you the same student over the four, how much they oh. grow into themselves, right? Absolutely yeah. correct. <laughs> yeah. And so, so like I, ha I can have the same student for four years and I start, we start in one place together 
And my, my job is to be as much of a mentor as it is to be a teacher, is to, to, to encourage their, them to come out into themselves and express themselves. Mm -hmm. I didn't have that growing up with my teachers. They were like, okay, play this this way, play this this way, that kind of thing. I always lead with questions. Now, what do you think about this? How would you do this? And then I give them my, you know, my take on it as well. Mm -hmm. But we, it's, it's a um, discussion and it's a processing so that that person always has to engage themselves. Did, did you start out teaching that way or did you develop that over time? No, I always did that. Always did that. Is there anything that you didn't do in the beginning of your teaching that you now do? Has, has it evolved in some way? I might be a little less strict. I understand that entirely. Do you? Well, I, because, because I think, uh, not, not to go off track here a little bit, but yeah. I think when you're first teaching, if you've never taught before, you there's a little bit of insecurity about whether you can teach or not, whether you can communicate the ideas. And at that point, it's a little easier to say, do it this way and be very strict about it. And I think over time, as you teach, you realize, no, you can let, let those strings go and let them play, let them figure it out. And then we can talk about how to shape that. Yeah, yeah. I think that's, um, that's probably very true. <laughs> I mean, I am a consensus builder, but I think that at first I didn't, um, I think I thought I had to follow also teaching at a college or, you know, in, in, a, in a, something that has a structure. You think you have to follow the administrative or the, you know, sort of guidelines of keeping somebody in line so that they go from this to this to this to this and their evolution. And now I kind of realize, no, there's not, you know, people are going to evolve how they evolve. And well, the more sure. you nurture them and the more you help them discover themselves, the greater that process is. Well, and the other thing that, uh, are you teaching mostly undergrads or grad students? Under. Undergrad. So, uh, so me too. So uh, I, my experience has been when they're 18 and coming into school, they really don't know the world that well. They haven't had a lot of life experiences. And if they are really diligent about what they're doing and they spend their, you know, working hours really paying attention over four years, they blossom and become a little bit more adult and they've had experiences and social interactions. And suddenly they're a different little, they're the same person, but they're, but they've grown in some way. It's amazing how much, right? It's astonishing because you can see somebody come in the door and you clearly, they don't know anything or very little. And by the time they're done, done, if they've paid attention, they know a whole lot. Yeah. And yet, and yet the truth is, and I'm sure it's the same way for you, as much as they know, and as much as I feel like I know, I still feel like I, there's a whole lot more that I don't know than I do. Absolutely. And my, I always, um, my, my underlying thing is to teach them how to learn. So okay. What does that mean? That's great. So that when you walk out in the world, you can continue your education without somebody mm. like standing next to you. Mm. So um, that's, you know, I have students that still keep in touch with me and say, I was thinking about you because I was just applying what we did over here, over here. And I'm so, I mean, I have one student that I just, he just, you know, lights me up because he, he writes to me on Facebook all the time saying, I just, I just applied this and this, and I'm so glad that you gave this to me. And I wish I had done that earlier. You know, I, you know I have it, you know, and it's just, you know, it's that's rewarding. <laughs> okay, so I'm I'm curious if I, I probably can guess the answer to this already, but uh, you believe that there's an advantage for a musician, a composer, someone in the musical arts, um, going and getting an advanced education. There are advantages to that. Yes. Yes, there are. I mean, Chick Corea didn't. And look what happened. Well, that's that's what I'm saying. You you don't. It's not a requirement of the universe that you go out and have a, a college education or even great training. If you're naturally gifted, you go off and play. Well, yeah, but he also got training by playing with masters. You know, I, I, I mean, Stevie Wonder hadn't gone to college when he wrote My Sharia More. Uh, you know, he was what nine or ten years old or whatever right, it was. Right, right. Yeah, and a, and Mozart, what well, Mozart was composing at what age? Three or four or something like that? Yeah. Well, so, you do have prodigies. And you do have... Um, exactly. But I, I do think there is definitely advantage because you need to 
if you have the right instructors, it teaches you how to think and it expands and teaches you to question going to, to higher ed. And it teaches you how to learn, hopefully. And hopefully, as you said, a continuing lifelong learning. Right, right. Because I think the, the great artists never, never think to themselves, ha, huh, I've got it, I've arrived. I think it was Pablo Casals, who some, he was in his something like his 80s. And he uh -huh. was working at a concert hall and said, why are you somebody said to him, why are you practicing? He said, I'm, I'm trying to get better. Uh -huh. And he'd been, you know, he was a master forever. And <laughs> that's yeah. what it, that's really what it's all about. Um, okay, let's talk for a moment about live performance and your process in live performance. Um, what would you say are the biggest challenges to doing live performance? Um, getting the gig. That's the biggest challenge. That is the biggest challenge. There's a lot of competition out there and there's a lot. It's hard for... Um, concert halls, arts agencies, that sort of thing, um, to draw audiences and, you know, keep, they have to walk a line between entertainment and art, you know, educating, that kind of thing. And so I think that um, we do have subscription series that, that work, but I think that that also requires a um, commitment and a economic advantage. Well, of course, we're talking again in the time of COVID, and right now there are no live performances unless right, you want right to. No, no, everything's dead now. Un so. Unless you want to play in a, a you know contained studio or your home or something and record it, but but uh, otherwise there are no live performances um, anywhere that I know of. Um, oh no, our our industry is shut down right now. It, it, exactly, all of the performing arts are shut down for any kind of live stuff. Um, but when you're performing, do you have a pre-show ritual? You warm up in some way or do you think things through in a certain way um usually it's <laughs> honestly it's so often let's get to the gig on time and let's you know let's get the like if we're traveling or something i remember once we got caught in this terrible rainstorm and and we got to the gig and we were soaking wet you know it took us a long time to get there because the you know the roads were so bad and we got there and then they had to move everything it was an outdoor festival and they had to move it inside and it was all logistics um and the other thing about... And how did you handle that? This is a, a, a lovely thing that I think a lot of artists don't understand. What did you do psychologically? How did you handle the fact that you were under stress now because you were maybe a little late and things were chaotic? What did you do to, to, to get yourself ready to perform? Anything special? No, I think um, this is what I, I tell my students. You have to have excess. What does that mean? You have to have more than is required you for the performance. So if you're up against those things, you can just go back and serve the music when it's time. If you're tired, if you, you know, if you travel to Europe and you're jet lagged, um, I went to Ireland with my two year old son and <laughs> I did not sleep for four days because his clock did not adjust mm. to the time change. Mm. And so I, Literally, and I had to be able to perform and rehearse and do all that stuff. And um, you just need to have enough extra. So if something's thrown at a curveball is thrown at you, you, you know, you have to be able to jump in and do what you do. So it's sort of like you're you're more prepared than you need to be in order Absolutely. to to do it right. Right. It's just got to be there. And and. Be. And that goes back to the discipline. It goes back to the discipline, yeah. And so when you're preparing for a job to go to a gig, um, you are over preparing everything then. Or you are so, it's just so in your blood, it's so in your bones from, um, I don't know what over preparing is, but it just, it just, you feel like it's there. If I'm, Dead asleep and somebody walks wakes me up at four in the morning and says, play this, you do it. That's 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 really excellent. Um has has anything happened to you in performance that was you didn't know what you, it was a big mistake. The the uh the sound system went out or the lights went out or or something happened in the audience. Has anything like that ever happened to you which theoretically throws you off your game and how did you handle that? Sound system, no. Um 
or has it always just gone perfectly for you? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't, I don't remember anything catastrophic. I remember once when I was touring with Frank Sinatra, a, um, you know, we would, we would be in these 20,000 seat arenas. Yes. They had these, uh, the lighting things at the very top and they, a handle from one of them fell. Ooh. And it, it hit right next to my chair, like there for the grace of God went I, because, you know, if it had hit my head, I would have been gone. And it fell and it bounced across and it ended up at Frank Jr.'s um, feet, he was the conductor, and um, and he goes, "Oh, what's this?" And we're like, we're all kind of like stunned, you know. <laughs> but and then we kept playing because it was like, okay, this is what you know. <laughs> but that's like, I, it wasn't catastrophic by any means, and it's just like one of those things you don't really think about it till later because you're so in the music, you know. <laughs> well, you, you, you've brought up an interesting um, topic, which is you've obviously worked with or for a number of famous people, celebrities. Oh. And um, do you find that your you you approach those gigs differently than when you're doing your own? Or is it all the same to you? Um, it's different because they take care of you. They take <laughs> we were never so well taken care of as when we toured with the Sinatra Orchestra. But um was he did you know him? Was he nice to you? He's he did not interact with us. He was a bit aloof for the orchestra. Yeah, he took his own limo into the green room backstage and you know, that sort of thing. Frank Jr. was Oh the, Jr. was nice to you. Well, he was your conductor. I would think he would need to. Well, you know, you can have people with attitudes. Not to diss them all, but there are some that have. Yeah, know. yeah. In the arts, you can find some attitudes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that is for sure. Um, all right. So, do you do anything now differently than when you first started out? When you were first performing, was there was there anything that you did then that you over time have learned? No, I'm not going to do that that way. I'm going to do it this way. I. Uh... Yeah, I used to really rev myself up on caffeine and, you know, get my energy up. And now I meditate. <laughs> From caffeine to meditation. And how has that impacted your playing? I can, I, I think it's a personality change more than anything over the years. You know, it's like the older you get, the more, the more you just want to kind of settle in and be grounded as opposed to be zipping all over the place. Um, well, has it, has it changed your playing in some way? Has it made you play in a mellower way? Or is it um, taking you from, you felt like you were really pressing at times when you, now you don't, that kind of thing? I think that, I think that my approach to playing has changed. I think that I, um, this is going to sound, it might sound weird, but I think, you know, jazz has been a male dominated form for a very long time. Of course. And it's been um, sort of testosterone based. Except for the singers. There's right. lots of really good female jazz singers for sure. Oh, absolutely. And there's wonderful, there are wonderful female jazz musicians throughout jazz, you know, right. piano players and horn players, everything. I'm not, but it still has been dominated by the male um, composers, the male driven kinds of things, which is just simply what it was and is, it's, it's shifting, but it's still, you know, and I think there's, there was this degree of um, urgency for me to compete in a male way, you know, to, to, have more you know that driving kinds of energy and as i get older and i know who i am as a woman more and i it's like it's great being a woman this is who i am and i have something to offer with this you know i i think that that's where that comes into play where i don't need to push so hard i can just be and how does that does that feel good to do that that feel it's like you've authentic it's absolutely authentic you've come tr truly into your own as they say yes yes I, I think that's really great. What is your favorite thing about performing in front of a live audience? What's the uh, best? It's the best. It's the energy. 
and, and so there's an energy exchange. So it's, um, you're doing it because there's a participation between the audience in you and the musicians in you. It's a, it's a conversation that's being had everywhere. And I think um, that's why COVID's been so hard on people is they're so oh. used to having that energy exchange and it's gone, you know, that now they're on this, um, this sort of bleak frontier that people have been on for the last 10 months. Well, what what's more magical than being in in a live audience and you're exchanging that energy between play, performers and audience. Right, it's, it's just amazing. And you know, what's interesting to me is, um, I think Frank, um, being with the Frank Sinatra Orchestra, when we first got into some of these 20,000 people arenas, you know, when I got the gig, I was like, oh, this'll be nice. You know, he's, he's, um, famous and he's you know this will be nice and but i didn't think about it because i had played with other people before that and when we got into the arena and i saw i felt before we even started playing i could feel all these people you could feel the energy of all the wars that he had spanned all the love stories that he's you know it just came flowing out and when he sang, you could just see the responses and people's response to him. And you could feel this thing and it gave me goosebumps. And I thought, oh my God, this is part of history in a huge way. Mm -hmm. And that was something um, that really made me, I was young and it made me really respect at that point, it was like the audience, I, I realized they are why we exist. Well, if they've if they are turning out in 20,000 units or people yeah. at a time, they're coming there because they love something. Right. When it's that many, if you play in a jazz club and 20 people show up, that's a whole different story. But if you are in a, an arena full of that many people, there that concentration of desire to be there is huge. You can feel it. It's palpable, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, Absolutely. You get a lot out of playing for 20 people too, I'll tell you. <laughs> you, you. You can, you, well, I know there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not saying there's anything I'm saying, but there's a, but there is a difference in that energy field. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. It's but a when, different exchange. Um, one of the things that I always enjoy is after um, a show going to a, it doesn't matter, a theatrical event, a concert, it doesn't matter. I like to listen or feel what the buzz is in the lobby after a show because you can feel it. And if the show was no good, <clears throat> the audience is gonna go out and tell you that through that energy. Absolutely, yeah. You know what I mean? I do. <laughs> My assumption is that if you've been to a Frank Sinatra concert, you probably walk out feeling pretty good because that you were there to see one of the great singers of all time. Yeah, yeah. How, you know, how much better did it get than Frank Sinatra, you know? <laughs> There aren't a ton of singers who are better than him. And was that, was that, did that feel like you were playing jazz in that orchestra? Was it jazzy? Well, they had, you know, I don't know if you've heard his arrangements, but yeah, they're, they're, um, was it Nelson Riddle arrangements or? Yeah. And, and, um, some Quincy Jones and, um, Costa arrangements and they're, it's big band with strings. So yeah, that the interesting thing for me about that, and I don't know if this is getting too technical, um, but they, because it was big band with strings and I was somebody who already played jazz, if you had a rhythm section that would be in, in the pocket and just really locking down with the rhythm and then the strings would come in and they always felt late to me. Hmm. And I actually talked to Frank Jr. about this and I said, what's going on here? You know, I'm, I'm really confused about, I have to follow the concert master, but how do I, how do we, why are, you know? And he says, well, you know, when I conduct, I bring them in smoothly because of the bow. He says, that's kind of the nature of what that sound is. And uh, whereas the other swing um, is, is a very pocket thing. And so there are two different functions. And it really, um, out of that experience, that's when I started writing for strings after I, after I did that. Um, that I don't remember how long we toured for. Um, it was over a period of, of some years, but um, we were just the, the Midwest-based orchestra. He had 
different orchestras that would tour with different, you know, right. stuff. But um, that was so inspiring. The writing was so great. And the treatment of things, that's when I started deciding to include string writing with me, with the jazz quartet. And I think I, to my understanding so far, I haven't found anybody else who, maybe they are doing it now, but at that point was doing that with a, a string player backed by strings with rhythm section, you know, horn players had. So, so it was, in other words, you were inspired to, to get into doing your own arrangements because you felt that this was not fulfilling what you thought was the great vision of it. Oh, no. I was inspired to do my arrangements because his were so incredible and because of the way it was treated so ah. beautifully. Yeah. Well, that, <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> really cool. Is there anything that um, you have yet to play either to record it or to play in front of an audience that you are still trying to get to? Is it something that you have in your future that you're looking to play that has yet to go through your repertoire? That I'm aware of. <laughs> yes, that you're aware, obviously that you're aware. <laughs> because yeah, I mean, obviously something's gonna happen, but. <clears throat> in other words, is there a song out there or a piece of music that you go, you know, I wish I'd play that sometime, but I never have. I actually have been looking at, um, as have many people, it's interesting to see this. Um, I attended an APAP conference recently. and, and what, what is we, APAP? Um, American you know, Arts Presenters. I don't know. It's the Association of Presenting Arts... Professionals? Uh, professionals, thank you. <laughs> um, I should know, right? But the... Um, a lot of the artists showcased were all kind of doing songs of unity and songs of, you know, that kind of thing. Right. And I had started a project a few years ago um, looking at indigenous music and reharmonizing it and create and indigenous musics that were of welcoming and positive messages. Uh, American indigenous or world indigenous? World. World indigenous. So I've, I've always been interested in that, the world indigenous cultures, because I believe that there are universal truths that are pervasive in all of them. No doubt. Music is one of the great purveyors of that. Yeah. So I was, I've, I've, I did some research and I listened to some field recordings and I, you know, that kind of thing. Um, and I did some arrangements and I was going to do this whole big um piece around it which i may yet do but what i realize now after going to that conference is maybe this is the time for the true indigenous people to step forward with their voices instead of having me as an intermediary mm -hmm. and that um and, and are you doing anything to help that happen are you working on that um not yet i just the conference was just this month and i just you know, so you're are, recently inspired is what it is. I'm, I'm recently aware that that I need to honor the source. And maybe, um, maybe I just need to stick with whatever comes through for me because their voices are equal is, or even maybe more important at this time. You know? I, I think that that's really worthy of you and and um, sounds like it would be exciting to listen to. So I've been speaking to the great jazz violinist Diane Deline for almost an hour now, and um, we're going to take this down the, the road that we always do at the end of Story Beat, and that is um, you've obviously been around for a number of years and you've worked with lots of different people and had lots of experiences. Um, can you uh, share with us any kind of an oddball, quirky, weird, offbeat, or maybe just plain funny story that's happened to you? Oh, there are so many. Um, the, I'll pick the one where um, I was performing at, there used to be a club in the Fairmont Hotel in Chicago called the Metropole, and I was performing with my group. And... Um, it was during the time actually where I, when I was, I keep bringing Sinatra up, but there was much more to life than that, but it, it just happened to be that time period. <laughs> um, and 
so we were, I, and I found this as a great opportunity to perform my compositions, right? I was really wanting to do that. And there was a woman there who kept asking for Sinatra songs. And so, you know, play, <laughs> play this, play that. So we did a couple of those and then it was break time. And this woman came up to me at the, the, the band table. We were sitting there and um, she said, you know, I really love your voice. You're such a great singer. I'm a writer and I've always wanted to sing. And I said, I'm not singing, I'm playing violin. <laughs> and she said, oh, don't put yourself down. And I said, oh, I can't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> now, how much she had drank, I'm not sure, but um, so then we go back up and, you know, it's so funny as she's talking to me, the band leaves one by one. They just leave me with her. <laughs> and so then the, after break, I get back on stage and we're playing and all of a sudden we hear, oh, violin. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I told you you had a distinct voice. <laughs> you did, thank you. I'd like to go there with it as opposed to. But no, it also comes to you saying people um, often expect that if there's a woman in front of a band, it's a vocalist, you know? It's the singer, yeah. <laughs> well, it's true. We don't. We still do not see enough females leading bands. Mm -hmm. So I, I think that that's um, something that needs to continue to be um promoted i guess would be the right word over time that we need to see more of it because those voices are missing from the leads of those things right and yeah. and it has been a patronage system for a long time and i think a lot of that is starting to shift in many ways um in all sorts of different fields of of art um yes. all right well great great story last question for you today diane um What's the best piece of advice or a tip that you can lend to those who are starting out in the business or uh, they're, you know, maybe they've been in a little bit, but they're trying to get to that next level. Not that we haven't already heard a bunch of great pieces of advice from you, but this is something that would be solid for us to share with our listeners. I would say, um, well, be authentic. Um, but again, realize the value of your voice and don't believe your press. Don't believe your press. Yes, good or bad. But there is no such thing as bad publicity. That's what they say. <laughs> but I know a lot of people that get a good review and they are, their heads swell up. And it's one person's opinion and it stops you. Well, it's back to doing the work. Right. Keep right. your nose to the grindstone. Yeah, and also just don't, I mean, I think my first article I was performing at, um, I don't know, I, the Chicago Jazz Festival or something like that, and somebody called me a master of improvisation, and I was in my late 20s, and I said, I am not a master of improvisation. I know this. There are, you know, I'm just growing. I'm just starting. I'm just, you know, and, but I see um, it's easy for people to say, hey, this is, you know, this is who I am. I mm -hmm. if they need it to bed. And the other thing I would say is to serve your art, not your ego. Make it Do about about the the music, not yourself. When you get up on stage, that makes it um, more. It's it's easier if your ego's involved. Well, then you can get. That's when you can get nervous. But if you're there to serve the music, it's not about you. Serve then, serve you the music. That's really excellent and i would also say um when you do that then you have to mark it with detachment because it's a different animal because that's all about here you're the product right even though the music is the product our marketing system makes you the product mm -hmm. you have to be sure that you detach with that it can be because again you can start getting too big an ego with your marketing or you can sort of freak out oh my god they're putting me out you know just it's what it is it's its own american or maybe more than that um you know animal and um lastly i would say that um right now there's this there's this trend where people are putting out a lot of videos because of of the pandemic 
but also in general. Right. That um, there is a, this, this idea that the roughness of it is, is authenticity, which is kind of a nice idea, but whatever you post will remain there. So what you have to be sure of is that the music is good and the visual is second to that. Mm -hmm. Whereas I see a lot of like past students, they're all made up and their, their visual is perfect and they're not there yet. And they're saying, <laughs> I'm not sure when it's good, a good time to post this. So I'm going to go ahead and post this. And it's like, if you're not sure, don't do it. Mm -hmm. Because when it's resonating with you as a full experience, then you're ready. Well, that's, that's really outstanding advice because uh, unfortunately, it's going to be around forever. It is. You think you you think you've erased it off the internet, but it's out there somewhere. It is. It's it's a dangerous world. It's a dangerous world for my teenage son. I mean, I'm I'm thinking the kids that are young are going to have a whole new frontier that you and I. Oh, for sure. Yeah, we're yeah. It's it's going to be a, an entirely different world when we come out of the pandemic than when we went into it. And as technology continues to increase in different ways, it's going to continue to shift the environment that people go into in the arts totally. Yeah, and we have to make sure that with the technology, we don't become a society of sound baits and media gratification, and that we remember that we the participation in. Um, each other in the arts. That's what builds compassion. Mm -hmm. And it rids us of divisiveness. We need to feel that connection. And as much as um, technology is able to um, push us away from each other with those things, it can also bring us together. So it's our choice and how we're going to manage it. Very, very true. Well, Diane Deline, this has just been a terrific hour on StoryBeat. Um, so much interesting um, information that you've given us on playing and process and also your, your own personal story, which is really kind of great too. And I just wanted to thank you greatly for coming on the show today and sharing some time with us. Well, thank you. I really enjoyed talking to you. And as promised, we have some beautiful music to end the show. So won't you please sit back and enjoy Diane Deline's exquisite composition, Winter Horizon, from her CD, Origins.
And so we've come to the end of today's story beat. If you like this episode, won't you please take a moment to give us a comment, rating, or review on whatever app or platform you're listening to. Your support helps us bring more great Story Beat episodes to you. Story Beat is available on all major podcast apps and platforms, including Apple Podcasts, YouTube, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, TuneIn, and many others. Until next time, I'm Steve Cuden. And may all your stories be unforgettable.